Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this very special program um, being sponsored by the Duke Center for uh, <clears throat> International uh, Global and International Studies and co-sponsored by the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies, the Rethinking Diplomacy Initiative, um, the uh, Development Program from the Sanford School and the American Grand Strategy Program, all here at Duke University. My name is Patrick Duddy. I'm the director of the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies. And I am very, very pleased today um, to welcome Keith Mines. He is the, the author of the recently published um, uh, memoir uh, study guide called Why Nation Building Matters, Political Consolidation, Building Security Forces, and economic development in failed and failing states. By way of introduction, I would like to, to, to just emphasize part of what makes um, Keith Mines and his book so very special. Um, in the first instance, Keith has on the ground experience in more than a, a dozen failed and failing states virtually always at moments of uh, danger and difficulty. Moreover, these experiences were not all, if you will, simply diplomatic. He is in fact a retired diplomat, but his, his first experiences <clears throat> um, were as a missionary in South America, um, but he has also deployed as, um, as an army officer, including later as a special forces officer, then as a diplomat, subsequently was loaned to the United Nations, um, and now is uh, the director of the program in, uh, for Latin America at the US Institute of Peace. So um, his is a virtually unparam unparalleled resume of, resume of experiences in some of the most difficult places in the world. <clears throat> so Keith, um, uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, and with, with that very brief uh, introduction, let me give you an opportunity to open our conversation today. And then you and I will have some questions. To those in the audience, um, we, will, we will give you the opportunity to have questions over the course of, uh, of the program. Um, uh, I will begin with, uh, with a few questions, to some degree, um, uh, drawn from my reading of, of his book. Um, uh, those in the audience who wish to ask a question may do so through the Q&A function. As we um, um, have nearly um, 100 participants now and expect the number to continue to rise, um, um, I'm afraid it would be unwieldy for us to try, uh, unwieldy for us to try and go into the, the raised hand function. So if you have a question, please submit it uh, uh, through the, the Q&A function on your screen. Keith, welcome and thank you for joining us today at this extraordinary time in the history of our country. Well, thank you, Patrick. Uh, and it's a privilege to be here. I'm very happy to have this opportunity uh, to do this. And I'm happy to, to do it with you, Patrick. You and I go way back. Uh, and uh, I can only say that Duke is very lucky to have you. You've got a wealth of experience that um, I know is appreciated by your students and, and by the other faculty at Duke. Uh, so it's a bit of a strange time to be doing a book launch uh, when no less than the president himself has twice directly uh, refuted the title of your book. Uh, but here we are. And I'm not being stubborn. Uh, I really do believe this is something that we have consistently gotten wrong as a country. And it's something we could uh, we could rethink. Um, my experience simply leads me to believe that nation building, uh, defined as the process by which weak and dysfunctional nation states cohere politically and reach a basic level of functionality, is a key U.S. interest. Uh, I believe it's gone better than we give it credit for. It's not always in, uh, in, about a military intervention at the, beginning, at the leading edge. That's something I think we also get wrong. Uh, and over time, I think it's the lowest cost uh, way to meet our, our challenges. Um, Given the limited time, I wanted to start out with something a little bit provocative, but I wanted to try to go right to the heart of, of this issue, and particularly the debate in the, the wake of the Afghan uh, withdrawal and, and all the things surrounding, 
surrounding that. So I'm going to try an analogy. I haven't tried this before. If it doesn't work, uh, we may hear in the Q&A, we don't know what the heck he's talking about. But let me give this a, a try as a way to, to kind of frame the, the argument and the discussion. Um, I, I would argue that nation building hits a number of, of really key U.S. interests from pandemics, poverty and hunger, uh, genocide, uh, refugees and the Cold War. It was all about the fight against communism. Uh, but the one that's freshest in our minds, I think, of course, is, is terrorism. And that's the one that uh, that drew us into what is now two of the largest and most controversial uh, nation building operations that we've uh, we've done. Um, there's a reason why my my uh, the picture on the flyer is, looks different than, than the one now. And that is uh, in large part because I just went through a bout with uh, multiple myeloma. I just went through a, a two year uh, bout with uh, with a, a cancer that that hits the uh, the bone marrow. And I wanted to use that as an analogy for what uh, what I would frame in this in this nation building uh, challenge. So if we think about the human body as a, the good part of civilization, the good guys, that's us. Uh, we think about myeloma. Myeloma is a, a cancer cell that uh, that travels through the blood, the uh, the bone marrow. So think about them as the terrorists. Uh, it, it, they're traveling through the the, the 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 human body without anybody really knowing it. And usually, the first time that you find out is when the body is is viscerally attacked, right? Somewhat a terrorist. Uh, in my case, uh, they attacked a rib. So unbeknownst to me, they had been traveling through my body for a couple of years. Suddenly, I have a rib that's been taken over by. By this, uh, by these cancer cells, so let's call that the 9/11 attack. Um, the immediate thing, of course, was to excise the rib. They took the rib out. Very strange process. And I remember asking the doctor, "How many ribs can you lose before this becomes a problem?" But he said, "You've got at least one extra, so don't worry about it." So, all right, now we're at this place where you've taken out the immediate threat. The immediate threat has been eliminated. But now it's a question of what what happens to the rest of those cells that are that are moving through the body. So, one way to do it would be to say, you know. It's too difficult to do anything, anything comprehensive. Let's just wait for another attack, and then we'll go after that. We lose another rib, we lose a piece of the back or whatever. Not a terribly effective way to deal with it, but it is one option. The other way is to do uh, the what, what you've heard of the stem cell transplant. So stem cell transplant is this very comprehensive procedure where stem cells, which are the real good guy cells of the body, are taken out, frozen, and then your body is hit with this high dose of melphalan. And one of the doctors described to me, he said, melphalan is actually a medicalized mustard gas. So this is something that just goes in and kills everything. So you're hit with melphalan. Uh, and then you have, again, a, a, a choice of what to do next. You've eliminated the, the immediate threat. You've eliminated most of the cells, but never all of them. There's still some that survive. And as the doctors make clear, you know, they will probably reemerge at some point. So again, the, the question is, do you say, okay, we killed most of them, let's leave that alone for now, and then we'll just kind of come back. If they come, back, come up again, we'll come back in and, and we'll take care of them. You could wait for the next attack. It could be in the back, it could be another rib. Um, that, that's one option. Uh, the other way is to do after this uh, stem cell transplant, which is kind of the equivalent, I think, of what we did in liberating Afghanistan is to do what's known as a maintenance treatment. So a maintenance treatment is a daily dose of chemotherapy uh, that, that goes on uh, and, and keeps all those bad guy cells at bay. And I would argue that that's the nation building piece of this that we have been arguing about. I raise it in the book in, the, in terms of whether we want a place like Afghanistan to be a platform for us to conduct counterterrorism or other operations or a partner where we help them to build a nation that can then uh, do a lot of this themselves. In a, another article I just wrote, I, I, I called it the sheriff versus the mayor model. Do we wanna be the sheriff that every time there's an attack, we run out and collect up a posse and go take care of that attack? Or do we wanna to try to support the mayor in, uh, in that small Western town uh, to where the, the sheriff has less to do because it's being well governed and they have uh, situational awareness and all the other things that go along with good governance. So that's the question that I think we're, we're debating. And I think we have gone all the way back 20 years in our thinking in some ways in saying that the answer is just to wait for another attack and then go out with the posse. I would argue that uh, that, that is a fool's errand, uh, not going to be very effective. And I think it is, uh, it is also a bit sloppy uh, in, in thinking that that is what's going to, to keep us safe and secure and, uh, and manage our interests abroad. 
Now, the maintenance drug in, in, in the case of, uh, of multiple myeloma doesn't come for free. It's actually a very expensive drug. It's $17,000 a month. Uh, and it, it, it has a certain cost in terms of one's uh, physical uh, capacity. It's a little bit debilitating, not too bad, but, but there is a, there's a cost that comes to that. And I asked the doctor, I said, well, how long does this go on? I mean, when, when are we done? He said, well, how long do you want to live? And uh, that is, again, I think the, 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 the answer that we're facing in a lot of places, that there are simply long, long-term uh, challenges in nations and keeping them stable, keeping them from falling into a place of extreme fragility that opens the door to all these other things is the equivalent of that maintenance drug. It's expensive, but not overwhelming. Uh, it comes with a cost. That cost is also not overwhelming. It can be can be born. So that's what I'd like to do to just frame the discussion. Uh, that's how I would I would characterize this. And um, Patrick, I'm happy to to get right into it. Okay, well that's just, that's terrific. And <clears throat> I must say your your analogy um, uh, it seems to me is fully consistent with your with your book, which is as much a memoir as a study of nation building because you recount your, your experiences on the ground in Colombia, on the ground in Grenada, on the ground in Darfur, on the ground in Haiti, on the ground in uh, Afghanistan and Somalia, et cetera. Um, in noting that, um, as we, when we get to questions, I invite our audience to, to, you know, to bring things up that, that are related to any of those, those places. But the first thing I want to touch on, the very first thing, and is, is, does this ever in fact work? Where has it worked um, um, best in your personal experience? Um, clearly the, the, the recent experiences um, and, and the, what we've witnessed in Afghanistan has suggested that at least in that environment in which we, um, we lost thousands of lives and spent apparently trillions of dollars um, but that hasn't worked. So, um, uh, hence the question um, or the 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 uh, um, the title of this this session was, you know, does nation building ever ever work? You've suggested that it does. Where has it worked? Well, let me let me start with another provocative statement, and that is just that there's never a failure in nation building. There's just an incomplete success, and I say that not flippantly at all. But I say that because, you know, one, one of the things that we are, are, are worst about is assuming that, that, that something is only an issue when we are there or when we're interested. So, you know, we get super interested in Somalia, for example, and we were there for, I guess, about two years total. The, the thinking was that once we had failed and withdrew, somehow Somalia goes away. Well, it goes away for us, but it doesn't go away for 7 million Somalis. Uh, we just evacuated 120,000 Afghans. There's still 30 million Afghans in Afghanistan. So again, that country did not go away. Its people did not go away. They continue to struggle forward. Uh, all of these things, and I'll get into this, uh, I, I think later, is just the longevity of some of these cases is, is something that we are never quite prepared for. Um, but so, so failure is, is, I think, you know, something we need to be uh, more realistic about. And we failed at what we tried to do compulsively and, and on our timetable and, and in our way. But you know the, the struggle for political consolidation, as I call it, the struggle of a nation to move forward is still there. Successful cases though, as we measure success, um, there's, there's a number of them. Some of these are a little dated now, but there's, there's a, a, a string of them that we can point to from the 90s into the 2000s. And you know, they're all successes that, that uh, we have to be realistic about what is, what's possible. So these are not, you know, we're not turning countries into Switzerland, we're turning them away from civil war, famine, genocide, total dysfunction. During the Cold War, we were turning them away from communism. I've got some cases in the book. And those are, I think, not, those are getting more interesting as we look at great power competition today, because I think we're back into this question of how do we how do we build coalitions across the world uh, in, a, in a world that uh, where the Chinese are really cleaning our clock? Uh, but if you look at Namibia, uh, Cambodia, uh, Mozambique, uh, East Timor, uh, Sierra Leone, Liberia, the Balkans, I guess we get credit for five countries there because it was a whole series of countries, Albania, Bosnia, Kosovo, Macedonia that came out of that. And you could look at those and say, wow, those are all you know, really not highly, highly functional countries, but they are not what they were before. 
again, they are not countries that, that were in this, this case, this, this situation of civil war and of you know, real, real dysfunction. There's a number that, uh, of cases that did not involve international peacekeeping. Um, I mentioned Grenada, which I was involved in, Panama. Grenada is kind of a special case because it was so small and it was easy, if you will. But Panama, another case, uh, also, again, a special case because of our long-term relation uh, with them. And then the ones that I, <clears throat> I like the most in some ways are the ones where they, it was non-intervention. It, it was not something where there was a, an international invention, uh, intervention that was even part of the, the formula. And that was El Salvador, Colombia and Darfur. El Salvador had a peacekeeping mission, but it was police only. And it was only after the peacekeeping or the peace uh, accord was signed. And then Colombia was just a very long case of us supporting another country from a respectful distance as it tried to, to close out the, uh, the, the violent threats that it faced across its territory. And Darfur is a very interesting case of one in which we um, supported a political process with the Sudanese government that led to the introduction of a peacekeeping force uh, by the AU, eventually blended with the UN. But again, a very interesting case of, of, uh, of one where we were able to bring, uh, bring a nation out of, in that case, a genocide into a place of relative stability that still took you know, decades, several decades to cohere uh, in a very complicated relationship with uh, the central Sudanese government. Again, a process is still playing out, but certainly one that, uh, that got to a better place than, than where it started. So I would say more successes than failures in the end. And I would be, again, even reluctant to, to talk um, too categorically about failure. Again, Somalia is a fascinating example that we felt we failed with Drew over the course of the next 12 to 15 years. It eventually came together and is now a low functioning, but uh, nation nation that uh, that's back on the map of the flag. Um, <clears throat> you said you in at one point in your book, you um, you note that uh, Colonel Edward Lansdale cited a Vietnamese political analyst in saying that nation building to some degree, even sort of post-conflict stabilization um, requires 75% political effort, 25% military. And, and this Vietnamese analyst suggested that in Vietnam, we reverse those numbers. We 75% of our effort was military, 25% political. And, and, and he, he suggests that's part of why we failed. You um, use that uh, citation as a so segue and make the comment that we seem to have um, gotten it right in Colombia and El Salvador, but not in Iraq and Afghanistan. Could you elaborate on that just a little bit? Yeah, and that's a the uh, that's something that that came comes out of. I, I would just really um, promote uh, Rufus Phillips' book, um, "Why uh, Why Vietnam Matters," a very good book on a kind of a rethink about Vietnam, and it and it is Vietnam from the on the ground political part of again building this political consolidation that I talk about. Rufus is a living link to the Lansdale mission, uh, which is is quite. Uh, compelling. He's got a book coming out uh, soon about expeditionary diplomacy and how we do this stuff better. But, but it was something that I experienced a lot. I wrote about it, I think, everywhere I went. It just, it, it really screamed at us that, that there has got to be, um, we've got to be cautious about how heavy-handed we are, how visible we are, um, and not hand the nationalist card to the other side. And I think we, we were very careful about that in Colombia and El Salvador. In Salvador, we had the the gift, I think, of, of Congress saying you can't have more than 55 advisors on the ground at, the, at any given time. There might have been a time when it looked like the country was going to fall to the FMLN when we might have gone in with something uh, something more uh, bigger than that, and, and it, it probably would have been the wrong thing. So it, everything had to be channeled through them, and the, the political leaders had to lead, and, and we had to, to, to support them, but from a distance. Uh, we supported their, their security forces um, comprehensively, but again, from a distance, the training that I did with them was in the United States when we built up a new officer corps. I think we did that quite well. At Columbia, we did the same thing. We were always uh, a supporting uh, entity. We never were too heavy-handed. We're never too visible. 
And I think those were lessons that that were were not applied or were applied inconsistently in Afghanistan and Iraq. Now, both of those were different, very different in the sense that the only way to do anything was to uh, liberate the country and then start a process where you know somebody was running the country but i think we were we were very inconsistent about how we how we applied those principles of being um cautious on the on the on the nationalist front i remember at one point in al anbar i was there with um i was the senior civilian representative or the governance coordinator as we called it in in uh, covering what was a third of iraq it was a huge piece of of Iraq, all Sunni, and uh, became the heart of the Sunni uh, insurgency a little bit later. But I remember the governor I worked with, Governor Barges, a very, very uh, clever and and skilled um, local political leader. And he at one point said, you know, the Iraqi people are, they're, they're just, they're tired of seeing the soldiers in the streets. They, they want you here, but they don't want you right here. And he recommended taking the play from the British uh, British handbook and, and moving off out of the cities into catonments uh, nearby where we could be again present but not right in their right in their space. There's a, a lot of other things in play at Iraq at that time and following that, but that was the kind of thing that I think we didn't always um, uh, think through very fast. And just one final thought on this is is much of this comes from the ability to very quickly train security forces. And uh, that was something, again, that I thought we just did better in Colombia and El Salvador. We had the capacity to, to help them to surge in a way that by Afghanistan and Iraq, we had either forgotten or just didn't, uh, didn't bother to apply. But uh, the, the rollout of security forces in both countries was, was so dismally slow that, um, you know, it just really uh, did not, there, there ended up being a security gap, which, uh, which we paid the price for later. Um, let me. I, I want to get to to another um, another issue, and, and also to respond to to not so much a question, but an observation I got through one of the functions. Um, both you and I have been using the first person plural "we" um, about a lot of this. Um, that raises the issue of first. To what de degree are, as you discuss this, are you talking about the "we" meaning? The, uh, the diplomatic and, and military elements of the United States government? And to what degree are you sometimes talking about um, uh, we, the United States, and coalition partners? Which leads me in turn to the question of, is there a, a correlation between what you see as success and working in, co uh, in coalitions or under the auspices of international organizations? Yeah, those are two great questions. And I, I actually fell into my own trap and I'm talking about we, you know, we as, as though we're the only ones that matter. This is a very good question, a very good point. Um, so I guess we, I'm talking about the good guys, uh, this coalition of good guys that we have assembled to, to uh, deal with whatever issue it is. And, and but it, it's a good point. Um, I think I've been referring to we as the U.S. government, the U.S., the United States, but but the we has to be uh, broader than that. And that's, that's, uh, that comes out um, in several chapters of the book. Um, I, I, the, the one institution I would highlight, promote, um, uh, that I was hoping I get a chance to do is the UN. And I think you know, the politicization of the UN in the United States, I, I would say is one of the most damaging things that has happened to our foreign policy over the past 30 mm -hmm. years. And it's, you know, it has basically shut out uh, a key partner that we've needed in a number of, of cases, and uh, in, in, in a very unfortunate way, it's become a you know just this this symbol of of, of internationalism or whatever it is that we have gotten uh, excited about. There's a little town in Utah that has made itself a UN free town. They passed a little resolution in their town that says we don't want any UN people here. It's a very strange thing, but anyways, the UN in this sort of operation is just a critical partner. And I, I talk in a number of cases in the book about just how more, how much more effective some of the UN uh, special representatives were than the U.S. counterpart that we imposed on a certain mission. It happened at least twice in my experience, and it was very unfortunate because there was some very skilled uh, UN diplomats that simply could have done, and in the end, did a better job than than the ones that we imposed on missions with the idea the that the United States. Yeah, the United. We sorry, 
here I go again, the United States, that the United States imposed on certain missions with the idea that, oh, this is somebody that understands Washington, we can talk to them, uh, they'll write us cables with a summary in five paragraphs, they'll know how to do all that stuff. Well, they did, they did all that stuff and they had you know, really no, no sensitivity to what was going on in the country that, that really mattered. So I think the United States uh, could be more, more um, open-minded about the, uh, the capacity of the, the United Nations. So that's one piece of it that I think is, is always ought to be foremost in our minds. Uh, Jim Dobbins at RAND has done a whole series of books on this about looking at UN peacekeeping operations and, and how, they're, how, how they're effective when they're not effective, but in general came to the conclusion that they, they can be much more effective than what we would do alone. The other option, of course, is the coalition. When the United States rounds up a coalition, there's times when that's absolutely necessary. There's not that the UN is not the right tool for it. So I'm not saying it's, it's a panacea, but in the Balkans, for example, it was, that was a NATO operation in Afghanistan. NATO, of course, went as a coalition. So I, I would, you know, there's, there's very few cases where we can effectively do this alone and that building of coalitions but also strengthening those coalitions, you know, strengthening NATO as the go-to organization for these things and, and strengthening our relationship with the UN, which I would say, again, has really been damaged uh, to our detriment. Some of the special representatives I worked with were just, they were just phenomenal. Lakdar Brahimi, who I worked with in, in both Afghanistan and Haiti, Enrique Terhorst in Haiti and El Salvador. And then the one that I, I was most struck by was Lanzanas Cuyate, who went on to be Guinea's prime minister, but uh, he came in after the Black Hawk, or he came to, to he took over the mission after the Black Hawk Down uh, incident in Somalia. And it was just like night and day to see how effective he was able to work with the clans to bring them to the table, get through a peace process, and at least buy a couple of years of stability in uh, in Somalia. But he had skills that they just didn't exist anywhere in the U.S. government. So I think it's something we should be a little more open-minded about. Yeah, I, certainly my own experience dovetails with yours. And as you know, I, I also worked with um, mm -hmm. uh, former Foreign Minister Brahimi or Special Representative Brahimi mm -hmm. in Haiti. And I, I, I agree with your assessment of his tremendous abilities. Um, I, I'd like to ask something that, you know, to some degree um, uh, encourages you to draw from two sets of experiences, and that is, or maybe even three. Um, you, you have a, a, a very compelling chapter um, on, uh, on Somalia, um, and, and, some, and you say some very interesting things about Darfur. Uh, were there lessons that we learned in those two um, situations that we, in your view, failed to apply uh, to the um, to the situations in Iraq and Afghanistan? Yeah, I think um, it, it was uh, Somalia was really a, a, a kind of an anomaly in the sense that there was no compelling U.S. national security interest. Um, uh, even not even what we had in Haiti, which was mass migration that concerned us on a humanitarian, but also just on a practical level. So it, it was it was a real anomaly in that in that sense. But it was, you know, I raised this a couple of times that I think it's hard to get Americans to stop being Americans. We care about what goes on in the world, as does much of the rest of the world. So the whole responsibility to protect came out of a desire to do better when a nation is, uh, is killing its own citizens. And that's effectively what was happening in the breakdown of the Somali nation, where it was had been captured by warlords that were mm -hmm. literally stealing food from, from children, if you will, and uh, selling it or, or hijacking it or whatever. It was just a horrible case. So, you know, we ended up in this situation where we were, um, we were trying to restore order to this very broken, uh, broken place. Um, and I think that uh, the, the first lesson was simple longevity, that it was always going to be a very long-term enterprise. Uh, and it was one that we just needed to, to pace ourselves in. But the big lesson that I, I experienced, and I got there just after the Black Hawk Down incident uh, and into 1994, um, was that I think we missed the, the, the central political imperative of these these situations. And we tried to either fight our way out of it or buy our way out of it with, it, with international assistance and aid and 
If we just do all these projects, everybody will be happy. But there's a, there's a very visceral political uh, dynamic in these places. People want to know, you know, what is this new nation going to look like? And, and where am I in all this? And where is my clan in this? And the leaders are all vying for, for, uh, for, for primacy. And the Black Hawk Down incident itself, it, it was a breakdown completely of political understanding of what was going on. It was a misreading of signals between UN security forces, Pakistanis tragically in, in that case, and, um, uh, and, and, and the, uh, the, the forces of Mohammed Farah ID. So there was this political dynamic that was playing out in military terms among the, the Somali clans, which we have then inserted ourselves into. I don't think that we did enough to understand that. And I think that was a lesson that we kind of brought with us into Afghanistan and Iraq. I don't think in either place we took total stock of what we were facing uh, in those two countries uh, that was going to be necessary to build uh, long-term stability and build a nation. And again, in my triangle of, you know, I've got political consolidation, economic development, building security forces, political consolidation is definitely at the top. The other two are, are supporting pillars of it, but it is the thing that, that we've got to, to, to keep our eyes on constantly. And I, I don't think we did that as well as we could have. There was a number of just things that um, that from the start, I think we we misread signals and and uh, and we're not able to adjust uh, uh, politically uh, as things developed in either country in a way that was <clears throat> was going to give them the, the stability that they needed. We, the United States, in this case. Um, thanks, um, Keith. I am uh, I'm going to go to the list of questions um, <clears throat> now as as they're beginning to pile up, and I'm I'm afraid that. With only another 28 minutes left, um, we may not get to all of them. Um, so if you will bear with me, um, one of our um, uh, viewers has asked, um, if you would please talk about the relationship between democracy and nation building. <clears throat> the writer says, aren't they a bit contradictory since a, a democracy is a system um, which in effect weakens the all powerful state while nation building requires a strong state. Isn't this a flaw in the way that the US nation builds? Yeah, that, that's a great question. And the, the democracy issue is one that I think we need to, um, you know, it's a tricky one. A lot of these are, are they're, they're not, it's, it's not black and white. And it's, it's not to say that, that, you know, the US failed to read certain things. Some things we read properly and it just, it was just always going to be difficult. The question of democracy, what I would, suggest is that the only long-term road to uh, stability ultimately is consensual governance. And, um, and so democracy, I think, is, is the ultimate goal. I think in many cases, um, everyone would be better served by accepting something less than democracy on the road to that consensual governance, to that ultimate democracy, um, just, just to maintain stability and to avoid some of the worst of, uh, in some of these cases. I think Libya and Syria, of course, are two recent examples, we would do well to think about um, setting them on this course uh, or allowing this course that then led to their, uh, their, uh, their collapse was certainly not, uh, not a, a good move. But, uh, but democracy ultimately, I think, uh, needs to be the goal. I think it ought to be the goal. But, but it raises another issue that we experience in almost all of these cases, and that is the transitional phase invariably leads to uh, a weakened security sector and huge gaps in security. And that, that is something that's absolutely um, uh, you know, needs to be taken account of. And I, there's not an easy answer for that, but that, that gap, and that's happened in, in, in El Salvador, one of the better uh, examples of that, where you, know, you once had 12,000 insurgents, you now have 60,000 gang members. And um, so you had this gap in security that just wasn't filled. And that, that's, a, that's a very important, uh, Point. I think there's ways we can do that better, but it's certainly going to probably come with the, the territory in many of these many of these transitions. You know, um, an, another interesting question, and it to some degree um, is is a version of of something I I think I've raised with you before. Um, you know, as we as we look at some of of the places in which um, the U.S. or the U.N. or 
coalitions of, of regional players have, have intervened. Um, we, we note that they have often been dealing with clans or regional ethnicities, um, which have um, traditionally fought with, if not um, simply um, uh, experienced friction with neighboring ethnicities and or clans. So one of the one of one of our um, viewers um, asks, from your point of view, um, what do you think constitutes a nation? And the 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 follow-on question I would have is, um, do you think there was a debate in a place like Afghanistan, given the very strong ethnic identifications of certain regions, was there a debate on on whether uh, or not it was worth trying to um, retain um, Afghanistan as a single unified entity? So, so what uh, do you think the nation is? Yeah, no, there's a lot to unpack there. Let me let me try to hit uh, the, these various threads. So the way I'm defining uh, defining nation building, and there is some there's some definitional things here that are probably important because I define it a little bit differently, but. I look at the nation state, the nation being the result of a political compact that unites a people of a certain territory under a single identity, very generic. And the state I look at is the institutions that manage the business of governing that nation. Um, so the state, the nation is kind of more emotional. I'm a member of this nation. The state is more practical and bureaucratic. Uh, but those two together uh, form the nation state. And there's been places where there's one without the other. Yugoslavia had very good state institutions without a national framework, and it broke apart, of course, when the Soviets fell apart. And the Somalis are sort of a nation without a state. Um, El Salvador, frankly, is a little frayed in both. Um, so that's the way I look at and define the uh, the nation state. And I think, I think both of them have uh, things that, that, that can be worked on. One of the things that I do get impatient with is when People just say, well, well, we outsiders can't have anything to do with this. This is not our business. We just had it yesterday from a very prominent senator who said we had good intentions about what we might have wanted in Afghanistan, but let's face it, we can't get 30% of Americans to get a vaccine. We can't get 30% of Americans to acknowledge the results of a presidential election. Do we really think we can determine what the culture of another country should be? So that's a very common statement now. That's a great soundbite. I'm sure that'll play well uh, to the citizens of Southern Virginia. I'm not sure how accurate it is, and I'm not sure how helpful it is, in the sense that, first of all, the, the culture of a country is often not defined by the actions of a few in that country. So if we're defining the culture of Afghanistan as one in which terrorists flourish and can attack people in the world, well, first of all, that's unacceptable because we're the ones that got attacked. But second of all, it, it wasn't a reflection of the country at all. There's, a, there's a, a real wave of the instant Afghan experts that are now saying, well, Afghanistan was never a nation to begin with. It was always just a collection of tribes. This was never going to work. Well, historically, that's just not accurate. Uh, Afghanistan has gone through a long process of cohering as a nation. Borders are tricky. And uh, any, any border, frankly, that the British had something to do with arranging is probably you know, going to have problems uh, throughout the Middle East as well, because they, they designed borders for their interests and not for that of the citizens of those places. So absolutely, there's border issues, there's regional issues, there's a lot of things in this. But Afghanistan as a, as a country within borders, that, that's, that's what it is. That's what we've got to work with. We, the United States, the international community, those that are concerned about the issues there. And the Afghans feel feel their, their part in a nation. When I was in Northern Afghanistan as the uh, consul general there across the nine <clears throat> provinces of the North, um, I loved what one of the governors said. He said, we are too divided as, as the North to divide from the rest of the country. And that was always one thing that you would hear. Well, why, don't, why, don't, why doesn't someone break the country up? Why don't they break apart? That's not really what they want. And we went through the same thing. Again, we, the international community, working with with the Iraqis to build that nation, um, th there was questions about federalism. And I wrote about this myself at the time because I wondered, you know, is there a federalist arrangement? And what I had in mind was an 18 state federation, not a three, a tri-state federation. And the federation experts that I, I consulted with said, you know, when you if you have a tri-state federation in a country like this, it will invariably break up. 
The Iraqis are very sensitive about the issue of nation of, of federalism, particularly if it's imposed from the outside, because they really don't want to break up. And they, this last thing they want is for foreigners to come in and break up their country. That was a very sensitive issue, and yet smart people were promoting that as the answer to Iraq. Well, somehow they've held together. Uh, the breakup would have been incredibly complicated. It would have had tons of problems between the Kurds and the Turks. The Sunnis and the Shia would have never figured it out because the oil is mostly in the Shia areas. The Sunnis would have been without oil. It would have been a mess. The answer was within those imperfect borders to continue to try to build that nation, which the international community, God bless them, has, has done and has stayed with the project. And Iraq, again, a weak state, a corrupt state, lots of problems, but still still a nation. Let, let me ask you, uh, there, there are a couple of really, I think, very compelling questions that have come in. Um, one is, uh, to what degree uh, do you think, or in your experience, has nation building been most successful or, or perhaps least successful when preceded by a military intervention? How, how important is um, uh, the security situation? And, and, and does not nation building only in a sense commence when security situation deteriorates to a certain point? Well, I mean, I, I would say there's some cases where, where only a, a military intervention uh, can reset that country. Uh, Iraq and Afghanistan were, were two examples. You know, whatever we think about whether we should have gone to Iraq or not, yeah, I think it is the case that there was only uh, only a military intervention was going to allow that reset of the country uh, away from the Ba'athist regime, which had been uh, governing it so brutally for the for the preceding 30 years. And Afghanistan, the same thing. I think it was only an, a military intervention that could have uh, taken out the Taliban and then allowed this this reset of uh, of the country. So I think there's cases where that's the only thing that can work. There's a, a couple of examples of very brief interventions. Panama, again, was a very brief intervention that reset the country and brought it back to its roots. Grenada, very um, kind of a small intervention, but you know, one which took out a, a brutal regime and brought it uh, back to the family of nations in the Caribbean. Um, and then there's others where, you know, some of the most common are the ones where it came at the end of a political process. So El Salvador, you know, didn't get a uh, uh, an armed um, military intervention at the end of the process. It, it got police advisors, but it was still part of a UN peacekeeping mission. East Timor was also part of a long process, a political process in which the, the armed part kind of secured the peace. So there's a number of cases like that. So they're all very different, I would say. But, um, but, but the security, somebody has to provide security. So that as a, as a transitional issue is one thing. And then again, in some cases where there is a country that's just been hijacked, if I, if I could use that phrase, I use it in the Grenada analogy, the Grenada case, when a country has been hijacked, there, is, there has to be force applied to, to break that, that hijacking and, and, uh, and, and free the country from it. Um. There is, there was one point in, in which you were, uh, I think once again, referring to the situation in, in Afghanistan. <clears throat> and uh, in, the, in the early years, there, um, as various groups came together, there was a, a discussion of, of who um, the international community should um, embrace or support um, as the, the senior leader of government. Um, and uh, and ultimately, it was concluded that Karzai would would mm. uh, would would fill that role. But you note that at least some of the old timers, I think you use that term, um, wondered if perhaps it, it might not work to bring the king back. Mm -hmm. Right now, that leads me and and one of our viewers uh, uh, to an interesting question: What do you think is the link? between democracy and successful nation building. Yeah, so the, the, the king, I think one of my cables was titled King or Karzai. Um, I, was, I had the, the, the privilege of being in the first Loya Jirga in 2002. There was only a handful of us uh, foreigners that were there and I had a ticket and it was, it was really quite a fascinating uh, um, event. And I, I kind of go back to the criticism of, well, outsiders can't, can't, uh, we can't do this stuff and it's all up to them. Well, 
the, the way that Afghans make decisions traditionally is through a lawyer, lawyer Jirga, and there's been a, a several since then. It's just, it's their way of making decisions, but they hadn't been able to hold a lawyer Jirga for decades because they had been subverted first by the Russians when they took over, and then by the Civil War, and then by the Taliban. So they had these three successive catastrophes that they lived through, through through the preceding 30 years. So the first thing that the UN did under Brahimi's leadership was to engage them to hold a new Loya Jirga. And it was quite a process to watch that unfold. But, you know, the international community was the only entity that could help them do that. They couldn't have done it on their own. And they were quite happy with the support. There was no resistance to it. The UN sent teams all over the country. They engaged every village and figured out who the leaders were that would, that would naturally come to Aloya Jirga. They adjusted the numbers to make sure there was a, a fair representation of women. And 1,700 delegates convened on the campus of, uh, of, of the university. The Germans brought in, uh, I always found this hilarious, but they brought in a, an Oktoberfest tent. That was the only thing that was going to be big enough to hold all the de delegates. So they broke down one of their Oktoberfest tents and brought it down there. And, uh, and that was the tent in which the, the delegates all met. And it was quite an extraordinary event. They ranted and raved and, and planned and, and commiserated. And through the course of that, um, that admittedly imperfect democratic process, but a, but a very Afghan process, they selected the new cabinet, they selected Karzai as the, as the president. At one point, there was this question about whether the king ought to come back. The king had been in exile at that point for a very long time. He was uh, very advanced in years and he was not frankly all there. It, it, would, it would not have been a, a necessarily good arrangement for him to be leading this now very difficult uh, country. At that point, Karzai was really accepted by everybody I engaged with as the, the only one that could pull it together. Now, embedded in the seeds of the Loya Jirga, and I wrote about this at the time, it's in the book, but you know, we also saw the, the seeds of the unraveling. Um, corruption was going to be this huge problem. We, the, the, we weren't, we, the, US, the international community was not able to figure out this question between the periphery and the center. And I think that was even frankly, a, a bigger question to most Afghans than the king. They respected the king, they had this, some had a nostalgic view of when he was there, but it, there wasn't a real outcry. I mean, there would have been an outcry, frankly, if somebody had imposed him on the system, because that wasn't really where the Afghan people were headed. They were headed more in the direction of some kind of a consensual government that they were more a part of. But there was a lot of things that you could see were going to lead to this unraveling if they weren't handled later. They couldn't all have been done at once, but I think some of those were probably allowed to fester for too long. And that was part of what uh, what led us to where we are today. Thanks. You know, we, we got a question from uh, a former colleague who asks about the information flow um, back and forth between either Afghanistan and Washington or Iraq and Washington. Um, and, and this, I, I, this may be a, a slightly more difficult question for you, um, but did you have a sense that, and, and you have mentioned many cables and, uh, uh, that you and others sent back, um, did you have a sense that, that your analyses uh, were being read? Um, were decisions coming out of Washington um, in, in some palpable way informed by the analysis that you and others around the country were, um, were generating? Yeah, I, I, I would say it's a little, it was a little inconsistent. Um, there, you know, the channels for information always get, go through a number of different places. I would say in 2002, it was very direct because on the other end was, uh, was Jim Dobbins as the as the special envoy, and he was very hungry for information, trusted us on the ground. So that was very direct. Um, in, in Iraq, it was interesting. One of my cables actually got to the president where I asked for $10 million to, to provide jobs for the young men of Al Anbar. And he just said, well, what, what's the problem here? If mine needs $10 million, give him $10 million. You know, it was, that was very direct, however that got there. But there were other times when I'd see some things cleaned up by the time it got to Washington. I was advocating in Iraq, for example, for something like a Loya Jirga. And I remember that paragraph got cut out of the cable before it went up. Uh, you know, somebody 
thought that was not not where we wanted to head. And then I remember in 2013, my final cable from <clears throat> Al Anbar or from uh, from the north of Afghanistan that was actually not sent <clears throat> altogether because I was at, I was just making the case that we have come a long ways. I, I saw the progress in 2002 to 2010, 10 years of progress. It was a stunning amount of progress that had been made in Afghanistan. But I was arguing that uh, we needed to stay the course in a fairly significant way for a, a long time into the future. That was apparently not the message that somebody wanted to, to make. So that, that was, uh, so I, I'd say it was a little bit inconsistent. Um, I do think that the, the general tenor of what was going on on the ground was probably well known. And, uh, and I, think, I think that uh, if you look at the things that came out of Washington uh, over the course of say 2013 to 2021, I think it was fairly consistent that policymakers and <clears throat> things like the Afghan study report that the USIP ran for uh, for several years at the behest of Congress, they were all fairly consistent, I think, in in what they were recommending in terms of a longer term commitment, uh, staying the course. So I think I think the information probably did get through. Um, you know, that that raises uh, another question, um, uh, which which, in fact, um, uh, was articulated by, again, another one of our um, viewers attendees today. And that is, um, as you thought about these cases of failed and failing states, um, do you think that our long term um, presence in Korea, Japan, um, various European countries constitutes um, um, you know, evidence uh, or success in nation building? Well, I think I think that certainly there, you know, again, there's nations that that do take a very long time. It's a good question. What would have happened to Japan if we had just pulled out, if we hadn't had the Cold War imperative and pulled out? How I don't know. That's a very good question. Korea, likewise. Um, you know, where would Korea be today if we hadn't been present? I guess what I would say though that in these, in most of these cases, again, we've got a toggle between the the nationalist issue of you know sparking nationalism on the part of those opposed to our being there. This is particularly acute, obviously, in Muslim societies. We've got to be even more careful. It was it was easier in some of these other cases where there wasn't a kind of that 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 sort of a backlash. So I think there's ways that we need to be just a little bit more clever about about um, the indirectness of our of our support, supporting people a little bit more uh, indirectly, as we did, for example, in Colombia and El Salvador. Again, I think those are two examples where we were. We were able to do so from a, a respectful distance. It didn't spark that kind of a backlash. But I, but I do, th but I think also again in certain cases, cases and Haiti is a good example where we really needed, I think, to we the international community to just see this as a multi generational challenge, and it is going to go on for a long time. And what we tended to do was go up and down and up and down and up and down. That's actually a very costly way to do things. You know, it's like only repairing your car when something breaks rather than replacing the oil. I mean, you know, you, you, there's, a, there's a consistent way to do car maintenance and then there's a waiting until it breaks and then having a $2,000 repair. I think we, we tend to go for the $2,000 repairs in a lot of places when we could have done something more consistent and stayed the course and, and, and would have had a better outcome over time and gotten to a place where it was actually quite manageable. Um, another viewer asks, uh, about the, the, the budget for the State Department, would, um, would we do better if we simply had um, uh, more money to work with? I mean, talking uh, about now uh, diplomats in particular, or perhaps the United Nations. Um, is, is it a resource issue often? I think, um, you know, Matt, General Mattis famously said something about if you don't fund the State Department, I'll need another battalion of Marines or something. I, I think that. That, that there is a, a funding issue that's always in play, but I would I would start more with what we were doing with that money, um, and I think until we get the architecture for nation building right, and I have a whole chapter in my in my book that deals with the question of of U.S. government architecture for nation building. I think there's some really critical areas that that I would not put more money into until we had those issues in a good place. And, and I, I don't think I, I don't think putting more money into the State Department right now would necessarily be the 
the fix. I mean, the one bureau that does this stuff in the State Department, conflict stabilization operations, it has some very talented people, very skilled um, uh, people that have that have that, that could be doing a lot more. Is is not um, is not well placed in the State Department. So I think until we had a serious approach to how we're going to do this. Um, I don't think that, that resources would necessarily be the, the right issue. The UN, I think, is reasonably well resourced. We usually pay our dues late, but the peacekeeping budget is ginormous. It's as big as the, the, end, the budget of the, the rest of the UN. Uh, that, again, I think is, is more about um, how we're doing it and who's doing it and, and what the, uh, the political piece that goes along with the peacekeeping operation is all about. But that is, over time, I think, a, a low-cost way to maintain, st maintaining stability and keeping some conflicts from really flying off the, uh, off the charts. I'm going to give you uh, two quick questions. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, one uh, suggested by, um, by your answer just now, do, does enough of the money for peacekeeping get into the hands of um, uh, of local workers, do are we paying people enough um, to uh, militate against, in some cases, very traditional forms of corruption? Um, and are we giving them the wherewithal uh, to be to really concentrate on developing their own institutions? Um, and then the second question, which is not related to that one, um, but is something I've been I've been wanting to get to, and one of our our viewers has also asked: Is there any hope for Haiti at all? Mm -hmm. given the, the, the really tragic circumstances of the last few months in which we've seen the country suffer a presidential assassination, an earthquake, and a, uh, um, uh, and, and a hurricane, which has effectively you know, set the country back yet again. And you and I have both worked in Haiti on multiple occasions. Mm -hmm. So perhaps you can answer those two questions and we have about three minutes. Super, yeah, the, the question of, um... Uh, the, the people on the ground. Yeah, the, the thing that we that I encountered in many of these places where I was was that uh, jobs were were the first imperative. And there is, a, I think, a bit of a disconnect in the way the United States structures economic development. We're, we're all about the long term development. Uh, we don't like just providing jobs because it's very short term. What I guess what I would say is in many of these cases, there's no substitute for jobs. And I think we need to we the United States need to be a little bit more flexible in how we apply that. There's a very good book by Roland Paris that uh, gets into this and he, he calls it uh, sta uh, political stabilization before economic liberalization. And what he's talking about is that, there, that a, in a lot of transition economies, the principle really ought to be let them stay with their state-owned enterprises. And a lot of the things that we know have to go eventually, but at least to allow them uh, some breathing room where people have not uh, at the same time, lost their country and lost their jobs. So I think that's one thing that we, we in the United States, the international community, need to be a little bit more flexible about. <clears throat> I'm always bullish on Haiti. Uh, Haiti is a place that it just really captures the heart of a lot of people that go there. It's a phenomenal country, creative, interesting, dynamic people. Um, but yes, fraught with tragedy for a very long time. The one thing in Haiti that I would point to is the withdrawal of the of the most of the United Nations mission in 2017, 2018, I think was was not a great decision. And it was one that left the country really debilitated. And I think it's, again, the, the acknowledgement that a small UN mission, a small effective UN mission is going to fill a gap in Haiti for a very long time. And I think just need we just need to we the international community need to just settle in. I think it's just something with that there's not really a a substitute for, and I think with a, you know, a well-developed, uh, well-endowed international mission there with a really dynamic special representative, I think that can make a difference. And, and we saw that um, through a lot of the ups and downs that they had uh, from the, the mid nineties uh, when we worked it and in, in, uh, into the, into 2015. So a 20 year period when there was a lot of ups and downs, a lot of things that went wrong, but it never quite completely fell off the rails the way it is now. So I would, I would point to the UN. We, we may have time for one more question. And um, um, Giovanni, would you like to ask it directly? Um, my colleague from DUSIGS, or shall I? I can yes. go. Yeah, could you hear me? Yes. Yes. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm here with my student. And uh, one question is, 
most international organizations have frozen Taliban's reserves and access to loans. Could that spark a crisis? What is your vision of how finances could be used for indirect nation building? Good question. Yeah, that is a good question. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not um, uh, up, totally up to date on, on how this is going to play out. And this is a very active issue. So I don't want to get too far into it. I, I just would say that I think uh, as I read the situation and having arrived in Afghanistan, you know, in 2002 and seeing Kwashi Corps, seeing uh, kids that, that, that were malnourished, um, it, it is a country that's always a little bit on the brink. And I, I would just hope that as we, the international community, look at uh, the way forward for Afghanistan, that there is uh, some way to weave between the anger that, that, that the international community may have towards the Taliban and a recognition that there's still 30 million Afghans that are going to need international assistance to get through the winter. So I would hope that there's some kind of a balance between um, sanctions and, and embargoes as a weapon against a political leadership, but also a recognition that uh, that, that country is going to need assistance. Okay, well, thank you very much. And ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, for your information, I will forward any questions we were not able to address uh, to Keith and try to get you answers if he provides them. And in the meantime, I would like to um, remind all of you that his book, Why Nation Building Matters, is available through Potomac Books. And to all who registered for uh, today's webinar, we will be sending <clears throat> information on how you can um, uh, acquire the book and, and conceivably with a student discount. Uh, um, so uh, Keith, thank you so much for joining us today. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes thank you. our program. Pleasure.